So tonight is the February full moon night. It's called uh, Nawan full moon in singular and Marga full moon in Pali. And again, it's a very important night uh, because today is what is called Sangha day. This is the day that we remember the Sangha. And there's a particular story behind this that I will tell you about. But just to uh, let you know, there are three days, as you uh, probably can infer anyway, there are three days for the Triple Gem. The day for the Buddha is Vesak, that's the day he's born on, the day that he g uh, got enlightened, and the day that he passed away. So Vesak is uh, the first day, that's for the Buddha. After two months, he had traveled to Isipatana, and at Isipatana, he gave the first teaching, which is the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. So that day, which is a Sala Poya day, is known as Dhamma day. Yeah. And then, um, seven months after that event, comes tonight's events. So tonight's events concern very especially uh, Venerable Sariputta. So I'm going to tell you Venerable Sariputta's story. Okay. And also, uh, it concerns Venerable Mogalana. As you know, because we've pointed out before, the one behind me, standing on the right of Lord Buddha, is Venerable Sariputta, and the one on the Buddha's left is Venerable Mogalana. If you go into a uh, Mahayana temple, you see two different statues. Those are the statues of Ananda and Mahakasapa. Okay, so in the Mahayana, the important lineage goes through Mahakasapa to Ananda and then down through the ages until it comes to the Zen masters. So they have those two disciples. But in the Theravada, the uh, disciples that are called the chief disciples of the Lord Buddha are Sari, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana. Now, an important thing about this is that you don't b just happen to become one of the Lord Buddha's chief disciples. For one thing, you must practice for a much longer period than a normal disciple. Yeah? And for another thing, you must make an aspiration. I think you all know that Lord Buddha, when he was in his life as Sumedha, he made the aspiration to become a Buddha in his later life, yeah. And then the Buddha, Deepankara at that time, Buddha Deepankara confirmed that commitment and said that it would come true in a future life. So Lord Buddha was going through samsara for what is said four immeasurables and a hundred thousand aeons. To become a chief disciple, you also must practice for an extremely long time. But it's not as long as for a Buddha, of course. But it's for one immeasurable and for 100,000 aeons. So it's a long, long time that you're practicing in samsara to attain those that position. So it's not as far back as the Lord Buddha who made his vow under Deepankara, under the Buddha Deepankara. It's at under a, a later Buddha. There are 28 Buddhas, yeah? Venerable Deepankara was the fourth of the 28 Buddhas. So the tenth of those 28 was called a Nomadasi. Okay. So this is happening during uh, the Buddha a Nomadasi's time. And at that time, there were two people were born. They're called Sarada and Siriwadana. And they were born in 
uh, Jambudipa, which we now call India. Uh, but Jambudipa, it just means the area where civilization is occurring, really. You can take it like that. Civilization doesn't only occur, of course, in India. Yeah. So we have civilizations in other places as well. But it's what is what was really the known world. So we can say that Jambudip was within the known world, a civilized world though, not uh, a backward world or not a low world or anything like that, but something that was at a state of advance. So something that um, happened to Sumedha that was the Lord Buddha in his early incarnation, is he saw his father die. And he realized, first of all, that his father couldn't take anything with him. And he realized from that he inferred that he also could not take anything with him. So a similar sort of thing happened to Sarada. His father died also. And then he realized that he cannot take all the wealth of the um, family with him. He's going to die also, and that will all be lost. The only thing that he's going to be able to take with him are the good and the bad deeds that he's done throughout his life. So he decided to go forth and to try to seek liberation. So he distributed his wealth. Uh, many times in these stories it tells about how this was done, you know. Enormous amounts of wealth had been gathered, but uh, he distributed it to all the poor people and to all the people throughout the city and throughout the country. And it was difficult to get rid of all the money. Yeah, difficult to distribute the wealth. There was so much wealth accumulated. But he distributed all the wealth to the poor people, the people who were in need, and he went forth. And he gained many disciples. In fact, he got, uh, through his spiritual practice at that time, he attained the five abhinya. The five abhinya are the five deep knowledges, the five very great spiritual powers. And he also attained the eight jhana. The sixth abhinya is actually when you attain awakening. So he didn't attain awakening at that point, but he had attained the other five abhinya, and he'd attained the eight jhana. And at that time, the Buddha Nomadasi had arisen in the world, and Sarada and his disciples, it said that he had uh, 74,000 uh, disciples, he was a very great spiritual master with, you know, he's already got the five opinion, he's already got the eight jhanas and everything. So he had a lot of disciples. He decided to go and meet the Buddha and Omadasi and pay his respects. So he did that. And the Buddha, seeing him coming and knowing his potential, so the Buddhas have this ability to understand the potential of the people who they come in contact with. It's a very important um, ability that they have because they can look at whoever it is, they look at one person, yeah, and they know exactly what is right for that person yeah, or how they will be able to respond. So he, the Buddha asked one of his chief disciples, all the Buddhas have chief disciples, yeah? So the uh, Buddha Anomadasi asked one of his chief disciples to give a talk on Dhamma. And uh, he gave like a great talk on Dhamma and Sarada was inspired by it. And he, at that time, all of his disciples attained arahatship. Yeah. 74,000 of them, they all attained arahatship, which means, of course, that they're not going to be born again. Th that was their last life. But Sarada 
although he was the leader, he didn't attain arahatship. And the reason was because he had made in his mind this aspiration to become like the chief disciple that he'd seen uh, doing this preaching, stood on the right-hand side of the Buddha. Okay? And then the Buddha and Omadasi confirmed it. So this is an also another important point and an important difference between the Theravada and the Mayana. If you become a Bodhisattva or you try or you uh, make an aspiration to be a chief disciple or to be um, a great disciple in some way or other, it has to be confirmed. You can't just simply become a bodhisattva, you know, just in front of your teacher. It's not sufficient. You must make the aspiration in front of a Buddha, and the Buddha must confirm it. Okay. So, Sarada made his aspiration, and the Buddha confirmed it, and then he went and found his friend Siriwadana, yeah, and he, who was not ordained at that time. But he called Siriwadana to come and meet the Buddha because there was this kind of heart connection, you can say, between them. Yeah. They had been good friends growing up and everything like this, and they wanted to, uh, you know, um, wanted the best for each other. So he called Siriwadana, and then Siriwadana made the aspiration for being the disciple who would stand on the left-hand side of Lord Buddha. They always tell the previous lives, you see, because it's an important point, you know, that we don't have just one life. The reason we're here now, in the situation we're in now, is because we had previous lives and we made certain deeds in those lives, good deeds and bad deeds also, and we're now experiencing, uh, partially anyway, experiencing the fruit of those actions. It means for most of us, of course, that we did good things. If you don't do good things, you will get a rebirth in the animal realm, or in one of the lower realms. Uh, people who have done a mixture of good and bad deeds, they get reborn in the human realm. People who only do good deeds, but don't attain liberation, are likely to get reborn in the uh, deva realms. People who do good deeds and can attain high levels of jhana that means they've really developed their minds uh, to a high extent. They get reborn in the Brahma realms. Okay. So that's the way that the births and uh, rebirths work out. So uh, the best place, though, to get reborn is always said to be in the human realm because it's in an ambiguous situation. There's enough suffering to keep you on your toes. And also, the, you know, there's not too much pleasure, you see. If you're, if you're just blissed out all day and all night, year in, year out, you don't make the effort. On the other hand, if you're suffering too much in lower realms, you also can't make very much effort to... Um, uh, to attain liberation. So the human realm is a good realm to be born in. And that way you can hear, especially if you get reborn uh, at the time that the Lord Buddha's teaching is in, um, you know, is still available. So now it is, yeah. The period when the Lord Buddha's teaching, even though there's uh, many Lord Buddhas who are born, the periods when the Lord Buddha's teaching is available is very, very small. And the period when it's not available is very, very long. So you should also think about that. 
because not only have you got a human birth at the moment, but you've also got it at a time when the Lord Buddha's teaching is available and you can get proper instruction and make good steps along the path. Maybe, uh, maybe you don't attain liberation, but you'll certainly will, if you follow the teaching, you'll certainly be making good um, uh, steps along the path and it will set you up rightly for your next life. Sarada and Siriwadana, they carried on being reborn and reborn and reborn, doing good deeds during this long, long period, one immeasurable and a hundred thousand aeons, such a long, long time, really. And then in Lord Buddha's time, that means our Lord Buddha's time, Gotama Buddha, they were reborn before Lord Buddha was born. And uh, the uh, venerable we now call Sariputta, the reason we call, Sa we call him Sariputta is because he was born to Rupasari. His mother was called Rupasari. So he was called Sari's son, Sariputta. And that's how he became known. But in childhood, he was called Upatissa. Uh, but we'll call him Sariputta, so we don't get confused with too many names. Okay. And same with Siriwadana. He was reborn. He became Kolita. But later, he was known by his clan name, which was Mogalana. And as that's a clan name, like uh, Ku or whatever, yeah, uh, because it's a clan name, he was called Mahamogalana. It means the great Mogalana, to distinguish him from all the other Mogalanas, you see. So, um, they were reborn, and they used to, they were again very rich in their last life, and they used to attend uh, to festivals every year and um, they would go to the festivals and there would be a big show you know but like they would put on in the old days where the whole village would come out you know and attend the festivals and um, then there would be dancing and singing and there would be prizes given and so on and so forth so uh, Upatissa and Kolita would be the two people who would give the prizes because they were the rich people in the village. Yeah. But they attended these um they attended these festivals year in and year out, but one time they attended it, it was a three day festival. On the first day of the festival they were really enjoying themselves. On the second day of the festival, uh they were really enjoying themselves laughing when jokes were cracked and crying when, you know, they told sad stories and so on. But one day, that's on the third day, they got fed up with it or they got bored with it or they got, you know, they saw through it that it's not kind of really very satisfactory. Okay. So they decided there and then on the spot to go forth. At that time, as you might remember from the uh, teachings in the Tripitaka, there were six famous teachers about uh, at the same time that Lord Buddha was about. So one of those was called Sanjaya. So Sanjaya at that time was in Rajagaha. Yeah. And so um, this is before Lord Buddha had attained awakening. Okay. So they decided to go to Sanjaya and learn from Sanjaya. Sanjaya was a, what we say a parivajika, a wanderer. Uh, it's one of the Samana groups. I was talking the uh, one talk not so long ago, talking about the difference between the sh Shramana groups and the Brahmana groups. The Shramana groups were the ascetic groups. So the, 
uh, Sanjaya, and in fact all six teachers were all Samana, from the Samana fold. So they went to him and they learned the teaching from him and they became very adept in the teaching and they gained very many disciples. They had uh, 250 disciples. Right. But it didn't lead to awakening. So they made a kind of pact together that if at any time one or the other would be able to find somebody whereby they could attain awakening or find the path to liberation, then the first one would tell the second one about it. Yeah. So this is, you see, it's kind of prefigured in their earlier life. Yeah. Where um, Sarada met the Buddha and then he went and brought Siriwadana. Yeah. So that was like a prefigurement to what was going to happen in their last life. So one day, um, after the Lord Buddha had attained awakening, they, the Lord Buddha, uh, you know, after two months, he went to Isipatana and then he gave the first teaching. Yeah, And during that wasana, that rains retreat, he also taught the people who came out from Benares, that means the uh, Yasa and his uh, 54 companions, and they all attained Arahatship. And he sent them out in different directions to go and give the teaching to various uh, you know, in, within the communities. And the Buddha himself came back over to Gaya. Not Bodh Gaya, it's slightly um, just like 10 kilometers north of Bodh Gaya, which is where he had attained awakening. But he came to Gaya, and there he met the three Kasapa brothers and their thousand disciples. They were matted haired ascetics actually from the Brahmana group, not from the Samana group. But he converted them uh, through a show of miraculous power. Uh, he managed to convert them. And uh, then he remembered his promise. He had made a promise while he was still a Bodhisattva that if he ever attained awakening, that he would go back to Rajagaha and he would teach uh, King Bimbisara. Yeah. So he remembered this uh, promise that he had made, and Gaya to Rajagaha is uh, not so far actually. Um, so he uh, took the disciples, that's the thousand disciples, and he went to Rajagaha with them, and then he met and uh, gave teachings to um, King Bimbisara. That was on the new moon day before this full moon. Yeah, just like two weeks ago, but 2000, uh, 2,600 years ago. Okay, so it was two weeks before. And his disciples, of course, the Lord Buddha's disciples, would go out into Rajagaha on Pindapat, yeah, for Pindapat. And they uh, were out one day, and one of them, called Asaji, was walking through the town. Now, there's a way that you should go when you go for Pindapat. You keep your eyes down like this. And you walk in a very composed way with the robe over both your shoulders, with the bowl held like this. And you walk very calmly and you don't look around yeah, or flap your arms or get involved or anything like that. You just look down enough to be able to see where you're going so you don't fall over or anything like that or bump into anybody but you just look down in front of you and you walk. Uh, so, um, Upatissa, 
who was Saripu to, to become, uh, Upatissa saw Asaji walking through Rajagaha. Yeah, and he was very impressed. And this is also, I think, uh, an interesting thing because if you see a monk who uh, is very well composed, it can be very inspiring, you know. It can be really uplifting to see it because mainly people are kind of thrown about by the sense objects and everything like this. But you see a monk who is concentrated, calm, and just going about his business, you know, without uh, being uh, blown this way or that way, then it can be very inspiring. So Sariputta was very inspired by um, uh, by Asaji, and then he asked Asaji who was his teacher and what was his teaching. And then Asaji gave this teaching, and it became uh, a very important teaching. It's just one sloka. What it means is, whatever things have a cause and source, their cause the realized one has told, and also that which is their cessation. Such is the great ascetic's doctrine. Whatever has a cause and a source, the cause has been told by the gracious one, by the realized one. Yeah. That means the arising of suffering. That's the important cause that we need to know. Yeah. And then also there's its, its cessation, how things come to cease, how suffering comes to cease. That also uh, the great ascetic had taught. Uh, so this became, when uh, Sariputta, it said when Sariputta heard this, at the uh, first, in the first two lines, he attained path, and the second two lines, he attained fruit. That means he became Sotapanna. So he immediately entered the stream and became one on the way to liberation. Now this uh, teaching actually became very important because it became like an icon of the teaching. And uh, you will find it in, in inscriptions throughout um, India, uh, throughout Southeast Asia also. In fact, you can also find it in Malaysia uh, from old times, uh, like the 5th century and 6th century, like this sort of period. Um, they would inscribe this, and it was like a Dhamma relic. So you have Buddha relics, and you have Dhamma relics. Yeah? And you also have um, our Missa relics. It means like um, things that the Lord Buddha was in contact with. So uh, the Bodhi tree, the Lord Buddha was in contact with. It's a, a, a material relic coming down from Lord Buddha. The Dhamma relic is uh, another thing. So this teaching, this short teaching, became like uh, a, a summary of the uh, teaching that the Lord Buddha had given. And it was often put, if they didn't have relics, bodily relics of the Lord Buddha or of Arahants, they would write these words on a manuscript and they would put the manuscript in the Chaitya. Yeah. And then you had a Chaitya must have a relic, you see. So the Chaitya would have a Dhamma relic. Many times when they open uh, Chaitya's now and they find what's inside, one of the things you'll find is this verse. It became such an important verse during the Middle Ages. Anyway, Sariputta um, attained a Sotapanna, so he remembered uh, about his friend, Kolita, and he went to tell Kolita 
that he had found the path that was going to lead to liberation. Yeah. So they had made this pact. So this was the fulfillment of this pact. And um, so he told the Gata also to Kolita, and Kolita also attained Sotapanna. Yeah. It seems in a way quite extraordinary that somebody would attain uh, so high a state on so small a teaching. Yeah. But in fact, at the time, it was quite a revolution in thought. The Buddha started teaching conditionality. Yeah. Now these days, we take conditionality for granted. Yeah. We live in a scientific environment, in a scientific ethos, if you like. Yeah. Uh, but in Lord Buddha's time, that was certainly not the case. When you read the scriptures of other, um, uh, like the Vedic scriptures and so on and so forth, they're very much in a magical universe. Yeah. They live in a universe where there are correspondences. So they say things, you know, they used to make the horse sacrifice. And the horse sacrifice is the sacrifice of the universe. Yeah? And parts of the horse represent parts of the universe. It seems very odd to us now that the eye of a horse, you know, is somehow intimately connected with the sun. We don't see the connection. Yeah. Because our ethos is a different ethos. We are living in a world of conditionality. We understand that teaching. But the first person who ever gave that teaching is actually Lord Buddha. And it's really a breakthrough in uh, the way that people were looking at things. Yeah. But the Lord Buddha started teaching conditionality. So conditionality was really a breakthrough in uh, human thought at the time, you know. And I think it had that effect, really, when, um, when Asaji gave this short teaching and Sariputta understood things arise for a reason and they pass away for a reason. It's actually a breakthrough in the way you look at the th look at the world, and you know he attained perhaps a great uh, faith in the teaching, and he also broke through to uh, Sotapanna. The two of them went to uh, their teacher Sanjaya because you owe something to your teacher. Yeah, so they went to Sanjaya. And they told them about the teaching that they'd found that would lead to liberation. But Sanjaya wouldn't accept the teaching. You see, Sanjaya was probably given the same teaching, yeah? but he didn't accept it. Yeah? He couldn't accept it. So he didn't um, follow them. But their followers, 250 followers, they went to Lord Buddha with, uh, with Sariputta and Moggallana, and then they heard the teaching a bit more in depth that was given on that night, and all 250 attained arahatship on that very night. That's the new moon night before this full moon night. Yeah, but Sariputta and Moggallana did not attain to arahatship and that's because they were practicing for the chief discipleship so it takes more to go you know they have to get a deeper knowledge a deeper um, uh, practice has to go into it so it said that Mo Moggallana uh, practiced for a week and listened to the teachings and practiced for a week and then he attained arahatship. Sariputta, because he was um, uh, becoming the right-hand disciple 
and the disciple of great wisdom, that's the disciple who has the Patisambhida. If you remember in the chanting just now, we were, ch we were talking, we were chanting the Patisambhida, yeah, the Patisambhida Jnana. Because he was um, uh, practicing for these high and deep knowledges, he took two weeks and he attained awakening yeah, on Marga full moon night. So this is the night that we remember then Sariputta attaining awakening. Yeah, so it's a very important thing. And then something very, um, uh, something else happened that night, which was spontaneously, without being called, all the disciples that had followed the Lord Buddha from Rajagaha, that means the thousand, previous thousand matted hair disciples, and all of Sariputta and Moggallana's disciples, and Moggallana and Sariputta themselves, they all gathered around Lord Buddha in the Veluvana in Rajagaha. Yeah. So there was this great assembly of 1,250 Arahats who all assembled spontaneously around Lord Buddha. And the Lord Buddha gave the Owada party mocker. I think you know it, yeah. Sabapa pasa karanan, kusala supasampada, sachitapario dapanan, etan buddhana sasanan. Not doing any b bad deeds, yeah. Only doing good deeds and purifying one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas, not of the Buddha of the Buddhas. All the Buddhas gave this teaching. It's known as the Awada Party Mokka. Yeah. And this, before the Party Mokka that we now recite was recited, uh, this was the only thing that would be recited. They would gather, the Sangha would gather around Lord Buddha and he would just recite uh, actually three verses. I just gave the one verse there, but there's three verses. So he would uh, recite these three verses. Uh, it's about how samanas should behave and uh, about doing good deeds and purifying the mind and so on. For the first 20 years of the sasana, in this sasana, then this is all that was chanted at the Upposita day. Yeah. They would gather around Lord Buddha and he would just chant these three verses and that would be instruction enough for the Sangha. Yeah. Now in some previous Buddha's lives, yeah, this was the only party mocker that was ever given. Yeah. Throughout their lives, some of the um, Buddhas would only chant it once every seven years. It would be sufficient for the Sangha to hear it once every seven years and they would go away and practice. Others, six years, others, one year. Some chanted only six months. Uh, but many of the Buddhas only gave those, those teachings for discipline. Yeah. Our Lord Buddha, um, after 20 years, started laying down the rules for the monks. And that was to ensure that the sasana would last for a long time. So then they started uh, the chanting of the party marker, which is what is done on the Upposita days by the Sangha. But it's only after 20 years. Yeah. That same night, then the Lord Buddha turned to the Sangha and he pointed out Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana and he said that they would become his chief disciples. It, in a way it's quite remarkable because they had only just come in contact. The Lord Buddha had disciples going back to you know, when he had made his first conversions on the uh, Dhammachaka 
day, but he didn't choose one of those five disciples, nor did he choose the disciples who uh, attained arahatship during the first range retreat, nor the, the Kasapa brothers. Yeah. But these new disciples, one who had only attained arahatship that night, and one who had only attained arahatship one week before, he uh, named those two disciples as the chief disciples. Yeah. Okay? That's what we remember on this night. But there is another uh, part of it, and um, I can use it to conclude uh, the story about Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana. Um, because there's one other thing that took place on this night, which was that the Lord Buddha, at the end of his teaching career, um, when he was in Vaisali, gave up the will to live. It's the Ayu Sankara. So at that time, he gave up the will to live, and he announced to Ananda on this full moon day, he announced to Ananda that within three months, it's three months to Vesak, yeah? In three months' time, he would uh, pass into Parinibbana. So that's the other thing that we uh, remember on this night. There are these three uh, main things. Venerable Sariputta attained Arahatship. The 1,250 disciples spontaneously assembled and Lord Buddha gave up the will to live. Shortly after the Lord Buddha give, gave up the will to live, uh, Sariputta announced his own Parinibbana. So Sariputta and uh, Moggallana predeceased the Buddha. Uh, uh, Venerable Sariputta was in Sarvati and Lord Buddha was in Sarvati at the time. And uh, Sariputta announced his uh, Parinibbana. And he decided uh, his mother had, although he was an Arahat and had been an Arahat for uh, 40, uh, 44 years at that time, his mother had not attained path and fruit. So he decided to go back to his uh, home to the house where he had been born, actually, yeah, in uh, Nalanda. So you know now Nalanda is very famous university and everything. The reason is because of its close association with Venerable Sariputta. Yeah, it's Nalanda was the place where Sariputta was born. And it's also the place where he attained Parinibbana. Yeah. So because of that, and because of Sariputta's uh, great skill in preaching the Dhamma, when they founded a university, one of these great universities during the medieval times, they founded it at Nalanda. That's why it's at Nalanda. Yeah. Okay. So he went back to Nalanda and his mother was there. And uh, there's a nice story. I always like to tell a nice story. So there's a nice story about Venerable Sariputta. He went back to the actual room that he had been born in. And his mother uh, refused to look after him. She thought that he'd come back to the lay life. But he had not come back to the lay life because he came home, you see. So he thought, she thought he'd come back to the lay life. And she refused to look after him. The guards, seeing that Sariputta had nobody to look after him, came down one by one. First, Saka came down and uh, Sariputta had dysentery. This is what he was dying of, right? So Saka uh, took all the stools and cleaned out the pot, right? And then, you know, cleaned up the sheets and everything like this. And then he went back to, uh, went back to Tarvatimsa. And then a higher guard came down 
and they looked after Sariputta and then uh, the Brahma gods came down and they also looked after Sariputta and then his mother got the idea you know <laughs> I thought, all these gods are looking after my son. He must be somebody really special, <laughs> like this. So then Sariputta was able, because she eventually gained faith, Sariputta was able to give some teaching to his mother, and his mother attained Sotapanna. So, you know, I think you know about this anyway, it said that you cannot repay your parents for what your parents have done for you. Because when you're young, your parents look after, looked after you. And you think, you know, Saka comes down and looks after your stools. But your parents come down and look after your stools when you're a baby also. Yeah. And then they're, they're not high, highly developed gods and everything like this. You know, they're just ordinary people. But they clean you up and look after you and everything. And then they give you an education and they bring you up properly and show you the right way and introduce you into proper practices. There's no way you can repay your parents, is what is said. But there is one way you can repay your parents and that is if you bring them into the Dhamma. Yeah. So, if you've got recalcitrant parents, don't give up on them. Even on your deathbed, you might be able to bring them into the Dhamma, okay, like Venerable Sariputta did. But Venerable Sariputta died at that time. And his relics were actually taken to, um, back to uh, uh, Sarvati, and then they were uh, interred. The Lord Buddha told to make a Chaitya. So they interred those relics. Yeah. Later, those relics were divided. And some of those relics, and Mogalanas also, some of those relics were taken to Sanchi. You might know about Sanchi Stupa. Right? Uh, and they were buried at Sanchi. And 2,500 years later, they were found. And they're actually, you know, almost certainly genuine relics of uh, Sariputta and Mogalana. And um, when they found the caskets, those caskets had not been outside that stupa from the time that they had been put in the stupa. So for 2,500 years, they had been kept there. Uh, but those relics by everybody, this is scientists, historians, or whatever like this, everybody believes those are genuine relics of Sariputta and uh, Venerable Mogalana. So everybody say Sadhu.